Uh, I should start by saying that this, uh, this is really the work of Casper Steinman, who's sitting right there, who is a PhD student in my group. And also, this is done in collaboration with the New Federal Affairs. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of uh, methods now being developed uh, aimed at increasing the speed of admission calculations through fragmentation. And so the idea is basically that you, you write the total energy uh, as, a, as an expansion in many body terms. Uh, but here I've just written it up to two body terms for the part that the, the series continues. And then the, that, they all have that in common. Uh, what sets them apart is how you deal with the truncation, right? So the tricks you do to truncate this is a earlier process. Uh, that has maybe to do with polarization. Uh, and so I'll show you uh, a little bit about how how uh, FMO does it, uh, and then sort of <laughs> to use that to contrast it with, with what our method does. Uh, so FMO does uh, monomer calculations, but uh, these calculations of the monomer is actually done in a field of, of all the other atoms. Okay, and so that is to include many body polarization uh, through the Coulomb fields for these for these atoms, and of course. That is done so you can function <coughs> this as early as possible. But most of the many body effects come from uh, Coulomb polarization of the charge density. Uh, and so, of course, that the field changes the, the density or the charges or the Coulomb field. Right? And this Coulomb field also uh, affects all the other atoms, so you have to iterate this to self consistency. So, one thing to remember is that even, even though it's, it's called a monomer, it actually uh, knows about all the other atoms. Okay, uh, since you only have the Coulomb field in the monomer calculation, uh, you now need to make corrections for uh, short range effects, uh, such as the exchange repulsion. And to do that, then you do dimer calculations, uh, ab initio, if they're very close. Uh, and so then you get exchange repulsion, charge transfer, and, and, and things like that. Uh, this is done in the, again, done in the Coulomb field of the other. Um, Molecules, but this is not iterated to self consistency. Obviously, if the Steiner calculation will change the, the charge density here, but that effect is not included uh, for, for cost reasons. Cost reasons. Okay, so, that um, here I chose a Dimer calculation where the atoms are very close, uh, but if the atoms are far away, you also do a Dimer calculation. Uh, that is uh, because when you do the monomer calculations and the dimers are far apart, you use uh, a, a simplified representation of molecular charges, for example, to, to model the field. Uh, and so if these are far <laughs> apart, you correct for this by using chosen densities. That is to say, you do not do the SCF if these are far apart, but you use a density representation, a full density representation of both. So you go beyond the charge model. Okay, so that's the, that's the FMO method. So we're uh, applying some tweaks to this. Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're combining or merging the FMO method uh, and the effective fragment potential method. And so that, uh, which leads to this thing here. So here the idea is it's a little bit different. Uh, we still have an, an expansion in many body terms. We truncate, uh, so we just do dimers. The monomer calculations are really monomer calculations. They're done in the gas phase. So this water molecule does not see these other water molecules. I have these water molecules here just to remind you that this is not a single calculation on a water molecule. Obviously, we do the monomer calculation for all of these water molecules because they all have different internal geometries. Uh, after we've done the gas phase calculation, then we extract multipoles and dipole polarizabilities from the from the initial because we're going to do that. We're going to use that for the next uh, the rest of the terms here. So now we have multiple polarizabilities on all the water molecules, and so now we calculate the, polar, the entire polarization <coughs> energy of the system. Okay? So this is iterated to self-consistency. The electric field here induces dipoles. These dipoles right, will induce other dipoles and other water molecules, and so we iterate that to self-consistency to get many body polarization, basically to, to infinite order. Uh, and this is computed classically, like I said, uh, using Okay. 
So that will hopefully allow us to truncate this early without incurring a lot of error. Then we do dimer calculations. Uh, so, and again, we have two kinds here. The closed kind, where these basically you know, are overlapping. So we do an ab initial calculation on the dimer molecule in the absence of all the other water molecules. Uh, when we do that, we have to remember that we, this term also contains the polarization interaction of these two water molecules, so we have to subtract that. But otherwise, this is simply the uh, gas phase calculation of the dimer subtract the gas phase uh, calculation energy, calculated energy of the molecules. Okay, and of course, again, this is to get the non trivial case. If the fragments are far apart, then we calculate the interaction, the, the Coulomb interaction using multipoles, <laughs> static multipoles uh, that we calculate from the initial wave function of the gas phase molecule. And so we use the doctor particles or octopoles and all the atoms uh, on, on all the atomic samples. And of course, the polarization interaction of these molecules is already taken into account. Okay, that was the r 3 uh, to get MP2, the current implementation, and I said this is a work in progress. Uh, we calculate the correlation energy, MP2 uh, correlation energy. Again, for closed dimers, we do an MP2 um, calculation and get the correlation energy. If these are far apart, then we set it to zero. And that's actually in, in uh, straight MP2 ethanol and so, of course, then there are cutoffs for what is close and what is far away, and you can adjust that uh, by comparing with regular MP2 calculations. Uh, I should mention here that uh, for correlation, we go to MP2 and not DFT. Uh, so DFT doesn't scale well in this approach, at least in our hands. And that is because uh, the games where this is, is um, implemented, the calculating the, the, the grid part of the calculation is very time consuming. And of course, the grid part scales linearly. And if something scales linearly, then this fragmentation approach is a very bad idea because you end up calculating the grid, for example, of this water molecule twice, or three times. So the DFT calculations are not very much faster uh, than regular DFT calculations, both in ethanol but also in ethanol. So for correlation, we really focus on, on MP2. And of course, you can also extend this to to cover cluster and things like that if you want. Okay, so that uh, all my examples here from the water molecules just for simplicity. Uh, but of course, you, you, when you fragment something, ultimately for to do interesting chemistry, you need to, to place these boundaries across the real plot. So here's the protein backbone uh, that we used. So, for example, here you have a, an amino acid, and typically to fragment the molecule, we'll cut at this bond right here rather than the amide bond, because this is a much more polarizable bond than this bond. So, the idea is that this is now a fragment with, with the side chain here. That will be our monomer. And so, that the question is now how to, how to deal with the, uh, the dangling bonds when you do the SCF. And so here we uh, use a frozen orbital method. So the idea is that this, we cut out a little, a little piece here, so not the side chain, but this little piece, truncated with methyl groups, do an SCF calculation, uh, and extract the uh, localized orbitals. The localized orbitals that represents this bond. And so this uh, orbital here, which is sitting right here, will then be frozen in the SCF, and it will keep uh, bad things from happening, basically, when you optimize the neighboring orbitals. Now, this is done for every bond. So we don't assume that, that these bonds are equal. This is done for every bond during the calculation. And it's done in an automated fashion, so it's invisible to the user. Uh, this also means that if you want to fragment something else, like a zeolite or, or, or anything else, right, all you have to specify is where you want to fragment. And then the, the code takes care of the rest. It'll, it'll cut out a piece, truncate it with methyl groups, extract the, the orbital, and so forth. So there's no human intervention here other than defining where you want to cut. OK. Um, 
So this is implemented in games, as I said. Uh, it is implemented with gradients. So a lot of these fragmentation methods uh, don't have gradients uh, in them yet. And so obviously, this is very important if you want to want to apply this kind of thing. So here's uh, an example uh, for a small protein tryptophan cage. Uh, it's, if we pick a small one so that we can do a full MP2 calculation of it, so we can see what the air is. <coughs> okay, so when we calculate the energy fully MP2 and compare, compare it to the EFMO energy and the FMO2 energy, the air in the total energy is 4 kilocalories per mole uh, for EFMO and 6 kilocalories per mole for, for FMO2. And as you notice here, and this is, this is important, that what I call a monomer now in this calculation is actually two residues. Okay. You get much worse results if you only have one residue for, for monomer, and that's because, if I can go back here. Um, oh yeah, so that, that can also allow me to talk about this. So when you, when you make cuts here and here, these, these dangling bonds just become too close. So it's better to have two residues uh, within a model. And the reason you don't want them to be close is that <coughs> we have induced dipole polarizabilities everywhere in the molecule. So we will actually calculate uh, the classical polarization energy between this monomer and this monomer, meaning that you have uh, fields from atoms that are very, very close to the polarizability tensor, which is sitting in the middle of the bond. And so that, that since we iterate to self-consistency, that always diverges unless you, you screen uh, the Coulomb potential very aggressively with some exponential function, for example. And so that is actually where most of the error is coming from in the calculation, uh, in the EF1 calculation, is, is that this uh, induced dipole here tends to get very large because you have, you're trying to model something classically that really is coherent to run. So, but by doing um, aggressive screening, you can, you can, you can almost get it to converge almost always. And as you can see, the, the error is, is comparable to, to an FMO2 pressure. If you, if you do the gradient, so that's accuracy, how do, how do we do in speed? Uh, in speed, we're not much better right now. And that is because most of the time, when you do an MP2 gradient evaluation, most of the time is spent calculating the dimers that we do quantum mechanically. Uh, and so, since we don't, at <coughs> present, try to approximate that in any way, we do it exactly like the FMO method, and so uh, the calculations of uh, time are relatively comparable. But of course, this is just a, a starting point uh, for doing more interesting things. Right? So to do, um, one way, uh, one thing, or one place you can go with this is QMMM. Uh, so the idea is now that uh, for many QMMM studies, a lot of the, the protein structure that you represent is fixed. And if you fix the geometry right, in this region, you only have to calculate the monomer energies. You can skip all the dimer energies here, because the only thing that will really change is the polarization, and you do that classically. So this is actually a way of turning a linear scaling model into a QMMM model. Uh, simply by skipping a lot of the dimer calculation. Right? So you still have uh, electrostatic interactions calculated with multiples, the whole thing is polarizable, and so forth. There's no adjustable parameters, and the boundary is basically defined by uh, the, the monomers that are no longer geometry optimized. Okay? So you'll still do have initial calculations that connect these two uh, regions. So it's a QMMM method from that point. This will be very fast, and it'll have no adjustable parameters. Of course, we also have to include PCM, uh, surround the whole thing with a whole lot of model. The other thing you can do is to uh, use all the tricks we developed in the EFT method to cut down on the number of dimer calculations, and that'll also speed it up significantly. Right? So things like uh, charge transfer and exchange repulsion and dispersion especially, of course, is going to speed this up tremendously. So one way to think about this is actually that this is a way of, of having uh, effective fragment potentials that, that uh, have flexible geometry, so you can optimize this. Okay. Finally, uh, the setup 
with these fragmentation methods can be a little bit painful because you have to define all the cuts. And so a student in my group, uh, together with Casper, has made a, a program called Fragit, which is, which, is, which is on the web. And it's basically a graphical user interface that allows you to set up these complicated different files. Okay, funding for this uh, is from the EU. And that's all I have to say. I'll have Typically, you want to avoid very small fragments. So one fragment may have three residues at the end. In average, well, for a given protein, you basically define the fragmentation. And so if you have an odd number of residues, right, one, of, one fragment will be a little bit bigger than all the other fragments. But, but there's no inherent problem in that at all in, in the algorithm. Now let's uh, thank the young one more time.